Welcome back, everybody. We're here with uh, a new show, man. Well, kind of a new show, but it's uh, we're gonna. It's now the Criminal Law Podcast. Welcome to the Criminal Law Podcast. I've got here with Sean McDonald and Amanda Bowen. How are you guys? Good. Good. We're good. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Good. We got Johnny Wiseman with us. He's gonna be along and uh, probably ask some questions and uh, inquire a little bit. But the uh, Criminal Law Podcast uh, brought by DefenseAttorneys.co. That is right. DefenseAttorneys.co. So, uh, Sean, Amanda, it's time to talk DWI. I'm sure y'all get involved in a lot of those DWIs. Is that right? Professionally, yes. Professionally yes. involved in DWIs. Yes. I know a lot of people out there, even like myself, just have no idea, any, don't know anything about it. And I just kind of did a random walk around asking people, hey, what do you know about DWIs? Do you have any questions about DWIs? A lot of people just had a lot of different questions and things that they wanted to ask so because a lot of people just don't know so we're going to get into a little bit about it um some things that as defense attorneys you guys suggest somebody handle the situation if they're in it talk about the laws talk about all kinds of things like that so we'll kind of go all over so sounds good sounds good to start it off i guess what we can do is explain dwi law where we're at fort Bend county uh state of texas what what's what are dwi laws and when you currently? answer that if you would what's the difference between a dwi and a dui if we can get clear on that as well well so. let's start off with that what's the difference okay. between a dwi and a dui what's the difference between the two well dwi is <laughs> i like how you look at him <laughs> i was gonna see what he had to say first <laughs> DW, dwi is, is as you know it driving while intoxicated anything above a 0.08 or losing the normal use of your mental or physical faculties okay a dui is when you have a minor or someone under the age of 21 when they have any detectable amount of alcohol in their system they can be charged with dui which is just driving under the influence it's not the same penalty range as a dwi but because you're under 21 they say if you have any detectable amount of alcohol in your system and you're driving we're going to charge you with a crime because you're not of age to drink so DUI and compared to DWI is a, is a minor crime. It doesn't mean you're intoxicated. It just means you have alcohol in your system. You're under 21. You shouldn't be driving at all. So the DUI is the minor one and typically for minors. Correct. Well, yes, under 21. Under 21. Yes. Okay. But any detectable amount. So, yeah, I got you. So if it's less than 0.08. Yeah, the smell of alcohol is enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And that one's a class C, like well, a speeding ticket. Huh. Okay. Well, I guess that's an easy way for people of the audience to remember that is U is underage and W is for grown-ups. There yeah. you go. That's Very easy. Nice, Johnny. I like that. So there's, I'm assuming there's no sobriety te field test that goes along with the DUI other yeah. than just, a, just a, a notification or an idea that you have some kind of alcohol in you, correct? Well, they can still charge you with DWI. Okay. If, even if, if you're 19 and they think you're DWI, they can do field sobriety tests. Okay. If you do really good on field sobriety tests, you blow under a .08, they can then in turn charge you with DUI. Okay. Um, but a lot of times they just get a 17-year-old you know, kid that's had a beer and they're like, okay, we're just going to charge you with DUI and take you home or to okay. your parents give you a ticket. They don't even pursue, go into the rest of it. They, they'll just... Yeah, if it's if it's if it's a cop who doesn't think he's intoxicated by his based on his contact with the kid, then he'll just write him a ticket and tell his parents to come pick him up. So that's an on-site discretion to the officer, whoever's pulled him over, correct? Like right. they just see whatever the shape the person's in and say, you know what, this person, I can obviously tell they've been drinking, but they don't look like they're losing it, so we'll we'll do that. Right. Instead. Right. I think a lot of officers would usually do the first of the field sobriety tests, which involves the eyes. And that one's going to give them a little bit of an indication if they're dealing with somebody who's over an 08 or under. Okay. And if they've got a pretty good feeling that they're under the 08, but definitely have some alcohol on board, then they're going to end up with that class C. When they start that test, when, let's say they're doing that first step, that means they don't necessarily have to go through the whole test. They can just do one step of that and then just, correct? Right. Now, is the same way if they're detecting a DWI situation? Can they stop at one step, or do they have to go through the whole test? Do you know? I mean, they, they can, I guess, stop wherever they want, but any officer is going to want to get through as many of them as they can to get the most clues and, you know, develop their investigation as much as possible. Okay. All right. Yeah, typically the more tests you give, the more evidence you're going to have to prosecute the person for DWI. 
Right. Okay. So they, if they think your DWI after the eye test, the HGN, they're always going to go forward with additional tests because it's additional evidence for them. I got you. Okay. And does the DUI and DWI, does that also go for marijuana or other narcotics as far as being under the influence? It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's all the same statute as far as the same, same, same deal. Mm -hmm. Anything that has caused you to lose the normal use of your mental and physical faculties, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, a drug that you are legally prescribed like Xanax or a sleeping pill or something. If you have lost the ability to have your normal faculties, then you can be charged with DWI. Okay. That was going to be my next and question. If that goes across. The board and that's like a that. misconception. I have a lot of clients who are like, well, I had a prescription for the medication I was taking. And I'm like, yeah, I understand that. that. <laughs> but if you, if that medications caused you to lose the normal use of your mental and physical faculties, that's a crime. Even if you have a prescription, it's like, well, the doctor told me to take it. I'm like, yeah, but it also tells you don't drive or operate heavy equipment. That makes sense. So we hear that a lot. Can they do an effective test on site if you're doing something like, like what's the, is there a difference in their test with the, with the way that they're doing alcohol or a drug like you're talking, like a prescribed drug? Right. I mean, I think you'll see them do those same standard three tests on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a good experienced officer who's actually certified to recognize drugs in a person's system, which is a pretty difficult certification to get, I'll bet. then you're going to have a series of additional tests that they go through for, it, they're called a drug recognition expert. Okay. And they're going to go through additional tests that help them determine if there is a drug on board and if so, what category of drug it is. Okay. What, what are the three tests that they go through typically when you get pulled over? So the first test, and, and they're typically in this order, the first test is the HGN. It's called the eye test, okay. and they have you follow, uh, they say a stimulus, but it's typically the tip of a pin. Mm -hmm. And they just check your eyes for an involuntary jerking. Okay. So when you induce alcohol into the body, it causes your eyes to jerk. That's visible to the human eye when you're looking at somebody. Um, and then the um, one leg stand, which is you stand on one foot and you count to 30, and then the walk and turn. Okay. Are typically what we call the standardized field sobriety tests, the three tests that they give 99% of DWIs. That you flip flop the order though. Usually it's eye test, walk and turn, then one leg stand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, walk and turn, one leg stand. Okay. They still do the, do they do a, the alphabet thing? <laughs> the That one's in the drug recognition um, testing. Okay. And I've seen officers do it on occasion when they have maybe somebody who's got some physical limitations so that they can't do the one leg stand or the walk and turn. They might use something like the alphabet or they have a test involving your fingers where you touch your thumb to your different fingers in a certain order. So there's alternative, but the main three you're going to see 90% of the time are the three that we just mentioned. Okay. I've tried to do that, the alphabet, just mm -hmm. without having anything. And I mean, that's, that's tough. So I could imagine if you're in that kind of borderline situation, that would, have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to do an alphabet backwards? Just, oh uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's not usually the alphabet backwards. I mean, you may have seen that on TV, but what I have seen them do is say, say the alphabet, but start at the letter H. Oh, okay. So it's not bad. And end at yeah. P. Right. Yeah. And okay. so you're used to singing the song, but it'll kind of give you a test of a person's mental faculties. If you say, well, don't start until you're at H and, and you know, end at P and see if they're able to, to so do you, that. You start the song in the back of your head. That's right. And you take a few minutes to get to H and then yeah. you start to talk. Yeah. Yeah. In Harris County, I, a while back, I've, I've had a couple DWIs where they make them read a piece of paper in the intoxilizer room when they take them to the jail. They'll read a piece of paper that's essentially a tongue twister. So they'll have them read two or three sentences that's a tongue twister that's difficult when you're sober, but when you're intoxicated, it's extremely difficult, and it's, it can be quite entertaining sometimes if you have somebody <laughs> that's had a lot of alcohol on board and reading that tongue twister, it's... Sounds like it's it. powerful evidence. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're hard tests. I'm, I've actually done them. <laughs> yes. Um, because when my husband was in police academy, they have to learn how to, to do them, right? Right. And to really know how to do them, they've got to bring in some people and make them drink in sort of controlled circumstances and then bring them in and practice with them. And one thing I found, and maybe it was because I, they got me at a pretty high alcohol concentration, I felt like I got better at them every time I did them. Yeah. <laughs> um, they didn't think so, but I truly felt like about the third time that I did the one leg stand, like, I got this, I know how to do this now. There's like a trick the way you bend your knee and everything, but yeah. I failed miserably <laughs> on all of them. We, when I was a prosecutor in East Texas, they did the same thing. DPS would have a qualifying school and they would get the prosecutors and give them a lot of alcohol and they would go be the subjects to be tested. 
and it's like That's you know cool. i'm the wow. we're the worst subjects to be tested <laughs> and one we, we think, think we, we know, know it all to begin with and then you start drinking and you're telling them what to do and they're like dude just shut up and <laughs> put your foot off the ground mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so that was worst my husband was not impressed because i had heels on because i had just come from work <laughs> and i told one of his classmates well can i take my shoes off for this test because i didn't want to be in heels and when he said yes i thought it would be pretty entertaining to kick my heel off in the air at the officer and actually <laughs> with oh my, my shoe <laughs> and so they told me i would have not only been charged with dwi but assault on a peace officer that wow. night if it had been like for real mm-hmm. wow so they bring okay so they bring y'all and they give y'all they the, take your height and your weight and then ask you what your drink of choice would be and then tell you how much you have to drink. So when I came in, I think they told me I had to drink five beers in two hours, which was a lot and fast for me. Mm. So I was wasted by the time I walked in to do the test. So you're, you're in a room and then they bring you in. They to, keep us separate. So the officers don't know who's drinking what. And then um, at right before you take the test, you take a breath test. And then right after the test, you take a breath test. And right before I walked in, I was over double the legal limit. Dang. Wow. Yeah. And thought I was doing yeah, and so they really measure good. It, so they know each each person they send in there for <coughs> testing, they know their level. Like, okay, okay, we think she's probably at a 15. And then they'll go in and have them test them. Well, this person's at a point oh six. So the officers has to differentiate the two. It's like, well, I saw some really strong clues in the HGN. They're, you know, they're probably a 15. Or uh, I saw four out of six on the HGN. They're probably under maybe a point oh five oh six. So it's yeah. very it's valuable experience for the officers. That's really cool. How deep do you go into knowing as far as the results of a test? And what I mean by that is, I'm sure it, I'm sure it differs between people, like you said, between people who they are, man, woman, mm-hmm. 6'4", 250, 5'8", 140. Uh, it, it, it all reacts differently, correct? Yeah, like and how good of a drinker you are. I know when I did it in that class, there was a girl next to me who was about the same blood alcohol concentration as I was but everyone was finding her to be borderline because she was very clearly an experienced drinker and five beers for her she was acting pretty normal really so it can be you know there is some gray area there which is why they have the breath test because that's a solid line in the law if you're over an 08 then that's considered intoxicated it's not subjective anymore okay how many times do, well, how long typically when you're pulled over and you're going through the sobriety test, how long does that usually take? Do they have a time limit for it? Like they say, hey, we got to get this going in 15, 20, 30 minutes. And I, like, is there ever a time limit to that? I know that may be a weird question, but I just wonder if they're like trying to move this thing along. Not typically. I mean, the officer just does his investigation. I mean, you'll have a stop, you'll have field sobriety test interview placed in custody reading the dic 24 and then by the time you get to the station to provide a breast sample or blood sample you're looking at hour hour and a half okay to two and a half hours okay they have to wait for the car to be towed they have to inventory the vehicle so you have a pretty substantial amount of time from the the stop to providing a breast sample which is a lot of our our argument and in defending um, dwis is well when you stopped him he may not have been a point oh eight. When you took his breath test two and a half hours later, he was a point one zero. Well, was he a point oh six at the time you stopped him? Because it's not, they had to prove you were driving while intoxicated, not intoxicated when you provided a breast sample. So if you're a point one oh two and a half hours later, well, could you have been a point oh six when he stopped you? Mm. You very well could have been a 15 as well. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of our argument. If it's a close call, it's like what you, you, you what we call retrograde, retrograde extrapolation. It's, they can't show at the time you're driving that you were over a point oh eight oh eight. They can just show that at the time you provided a breast sample, you're say a, a twelve or point one two. And so, would you have a timeline in timeline in that in your report? Whenever you get the report on a DWI, would you guys know at this time he pulled him over? At this time, he asked him question. At this point, is it? How do you get that timeline? What's that yeah, timeline? Yeah, I mean, from? we're going to have a patrol video usually that's going to tell us exactly when the stop was. Okay. So we know what time that they would have to be proving the person was intoxicated. Okay. If the person agreed to provide a breath sample, you're going to have a printout from that instrument that's going to tell you exactly what time they provided the breath sample. Okay. So you know what time to work with. 
Um, but with the retrograde extrapolation that Sean was talking about, usually you can't have an expert give you an opinion on that unless you have a lot of information to fill in gaps, like the last time you drank, what you drank, the last time you ate. Um, and things like that, because an expert toxicologist or chemist needs that kind of information for them to actually say, okay, well then at the time they were pulled over, then they were this number. And a lot of times an officer doesn't get all of that information or a suspect doesn't provide it. Is he supposed to ask that kind of information? A good officer should. Absolutely. Ask all, when's the last time you ate? When's the last time you drank? Like all that kind of stuff? Because it changes, it changes everything. If you have a, a, a client who leaves a bar and he stopped and you know, three minutes after leaving the bar and the officer says, well, how much do you have to drink? Well, I've drank, you know, four beers, but right before I left the bar, I had three tequila shots. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, three minutes after you took tequila shots, that's not going to affect you. You're not going to feel the effects of that. That's not going to raise your BAC. But an hour and a half or two hours later, that three shots of tequila is going to hit you sure. and it's going to spike your BAC. Mm -hmm. So that's where the expert can, can try to formulate this retrograde extrapolation that well, if he says he had three tequila shots right after he left the bar, I mean, I don't, I don't know what he was at the time of the stop. If he looks good, he well, was he's really likely, high when he provided the right. breath sample. Okay. But at the time of driving, that tequila wasn't on board. I mean, right. it was in his system, but it hadn't affected his BAC at all. Is there, is there such a thing? Is there a person that does specifically that job all the time, toxicology reports? Like, is that their only job? That's all they do? Or is it somebody that has other duties with law enforcement or with you mean like to come in and give that expert opinion correct when i was a prosecutor the person we would use would be an actual toxicologist who is on staff with the dps the department okay. of public safety okay um but i suppose as as the defense you could always find a toxicologist or chemist that you could hire on as your own expert but it would need to be somebody with like a master's degree in chemistry or you know certifications in toxicology oh, sure if you're gonna have somebody <laughs> Test, testify on, on something. You want to make sure that their credentials are mm -hmm. where they need to be. We really, I don't feel like we see that that often, and except for maybe in a felony DWI, see the experts come in making those kinds of conclusions. You typically don't. It can get expensive. Mm -hmm. When you talk about a felony, what, what, what's, what would be a felony DWI? What's, what are you talking about there? So I'm assuming you're saying a felony DWI would be different than a regular DWI. Right. Okay. So it's probably easier to start at the bottom. Okay. So your first DWI, um, is going to be a class B misdemeanor. So that's punishable by up to six months in county jail, $2,000 fine. Okay. okay. Unless you have either an open container or you are over a 0.15, then that's going to bump you up to a class A misdemeanor, even if it's your first one. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's up to a year in county jail, up to a $4,000 fine. Okay. If you have a conviction already for DWI and you pick up your second DWI, that's also a class A misdemeanor. When you get to your third DWI, that is now a felony, a third degree okay. felony, up to 10 years in prison, $10,000 fine. Then mm. there's kind of one in between. Um, if you're a DWI and you have a child passenger in the car, so a child being somebody under the age of 15, then that is a state jail felony. Automatically first time, okay? So if you've got your toddler in the back seat or you have your 10 year old in the back seat and you're arrested for DWI, that is an L state jail felony. You're looking at a felony conviction and incarceration from six months to two years. So the ones we see most often, I'd say, are the third. Well, we see probably both the, with the child and your third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, how, you know, however high you go, third degree felony. So on all of those, going back uh, and going back through that, how much does it cost to hire a lawyer to defend each one of those? And does the price differentiate depending on what level it is or what class it is it, d it definitely matters i mean if you have a f if if someone let me back up your first time dwi class b misdemeanor between attorney's fees fine court cost if you're placed on probation you're looking at north of ten thousand dollars that's including everything that sounds class a misdemeanor you're going to be pretty close to that when you start getting a felony Attorney's fees are going to be roughly $10,000, plus all the other fees associated with up to 10 years of probation, plus you have a felony conviction. So felony convictions are devastating to a person's life. So you cannot get a deferred on a DWI. So That's going to change, though. We should talk about that. So when you get a felony DWI, if you were to plead to probation, you're a convicted felon. You lose your right to possess a handgun. You lose your right to vote. 
um, it's going to be on your criminal record. Many people won't hire a convicted felon. So those cases, typically, you are going to fight a lot harder because they're, you know, misdemeanor DWI is not a huge deal. Yeah, you don't want the felony on your record. That's exactly right. You can't so, get apartments, can't absolutely. get jobs, you so, can't get approved for a credit, you can't get anything. Can't carry so, a weapon. That's so, right. So yeah, then you start it, hiring experts and you start spending the money because the, the effects of that felony conviction are devastating. So, so that's going to be upwards expensive. of 20 to 30 oh, for sure. minimum. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it, 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 you have to fight those. I mean, you just those are the ones you and have to try. And that's still not a guarantee you're going to get it dropped either. No, no. No. I mean, the, uh, law enforcement is getting really good at prosecuting and, and are investigating DWIs. They are. I mean, their videos are now very high quality, the BAC or the breath test or the blood test, and now they're doing um, no refusal weekends. So let's, you just touched on that, and that's a question I have, no refusal. Uh, what is no refusal? I know that they, you know, do blood tests there on the spot. They do it on holidays or something. I've heard about it. I've never been involved in it, but I've heard about it. What does no refusal mean? I mean, how do you just not be able to refuse something? So you have a right to refuse a breath or blood test when you're arrested for DWI. They read what we call DIC forms and ask you, do you want to provide a breath or blood sample? If you don't provide it, your license gets suspended. If you provide it and it's over, your license gets suspended, but it's much less length of suspension than if you refuse. But you have the right to refuse. Um, if you're wasted, of course, you refuse. Don't provide them additional evidence to convict you is what I advise my clients. First, advise them don't drink and drive. Secondly, if you're, if you're wasted, don't give them breath and blood. I think even if you've had a little bit, refuse. Yeah. I mean, because you... It, so that's advice that you give to the audience, everybody out there. If you get pulled over and you've had one thing to drink, don't blow... I don't know one thing to drink, but if you've... I mean, I tell my clients, if you've had more than two drinks an hour don't provide a breath or blood sample okay but because when you're drinking you're not always a very good judge of whether you're intoxicated or not and you've lost the normal use of your mental or physical faculties so i tell them if you've had more than two an hour don't don't provide a breath sample don't do the field sobriety yeah society. don't do anything don't give them evidence to convict you some juries will still convict you if you look terrible on video but if you're drunk why would you do field sobriety tests to give them the evidence they need to convict you mm. just refuse well holiday weekends a lot of weekends now in Harris County more than Fort Bend is they will do what they call a no refusal. If you refuse to provide a breath or, breath or blood sample, they will go get a search warrant, which is, has to be supported by probable cause, which is the same thing they need to arrest you. They always get search warrants if they want them. They're always going to be probable cause to take your, breath, your blood. They'll get a, a prosecutor to draft the search warrant. They'll have a judge on standby. The judge will sign it. They'll take you to the hospital, and they will take your blood. They'll send it to DPS. Your blood comes back of 14. You, typically don't have a defense i mean you i mean absent in something in discovery that we could have an expert take a look at that, that the testing was wrong which we don't find much anymore you you know you're done There's nothing so you can if do. somebody doesn't go it, you know they take them to the hospital they want to take a blood test what if they just keep refusing while they're there smacking the meat needle out of their hands what do they i'm down on? yeah if they have a warrant they're going to tie you down and take your blood okay yeah but they're really get your blood the no refusal, really all it's doing is streamlining a process that they can do on any given day, right? Because on any given day, an officer has somebody, they suspect them of DWI, that person refuses breath or blood, that officer right there can start working on a warrant, call up a prosecutor, get a hold of a judge, and do it. But on the no refusal, what you'll see is a very streamlined process where they've got prosecutors on standby. They're just standing right there ready. They've got a judge right there. They've got a phlebotomist sometimes right there at the jail ready to draw blood to make it a faster, more streamlined process. Sure. So but an you, hour compared to three hours. Right. But you've got agencies, especially here in Fort Bend County, uh, the sheriff's office. They have a DWI and traffic enforcement team. You've got um, Sugarland and Fulcher who on any given night, whether it's no refusal or not, they're going to go get a search warrant if you refuse. It just might take a little longer than a no refusal weekend. Gotcha. I was always curious what that meant. It's like if that, they'll tie your ass down and oh yeah, they will take you in. That, that was one thing that I was always curious about. So when are the refusal times? Just to make sure everybody understands, because I'm still confused. What are the re no refusal? On on any given day, 24/7, 365 days a year, an officer has the ability to go get a search warrant. Okay. And get your blood. Okay. Which basically has turned your situation into you might have refused, but you're not really refusing because we're getting your blood. Okay. But on like Memorial Day, Fourth July, of July 4th, yeah, Labor Day, you know, holiday weekends where you might see a lot of drinking going on, 
there will be, there's actually grants that fund doing no refusal weekends so that the grants are paying the officers over time and, oh, okay. and that kind wow. of thing really where they just set up a system. Like I did it as a prosecutor and you could get like extra vacation days. You just go hang out all night long waiting for an officer to bring somebody in so that you can instantly do a warrant. You have a judge on standby and then usually you'll have a nurse or a phlebotomist there like on the spot ready to draw blood. So uh, if you don't have a no refusal weekend, it's just a typical weekend, law enforcement stopping DWIs, I would say less than a third, maybe 10% of the officers will go to the hassle of getting a search warrant if you refuse. Mm. In Fort Bend? You think it's more than that? I bet it's a half, half in Fort Bend now. Hmm. Okay. I don't see it. I don't, I, I, I don't know if it's that much. It may be, but half say we'll get a search warrant for your blood. Okay. No refusal weekend. Everybody in the county, law enforcement knows it's no refusal. Close to a hundred percent of the officers, if you refuse, are going to get a search warrant. Okay. So, you know, it's because it's so streamlined. It's not such a hassle. When an officer has to do it himself, it's a bit of a hassle. It takes a lot of time. So when you're saying and advising as a lawyer, and you're saying refuse at first, or don't blow, or don't walk, so that's considered a refusal. Yes. So as soon as they start, to, is there is there a tipping point where you refuse? And then you see that they're going to get a search warrant so that you give in or do you continue to let and them make them do the work? <laughs> yeah. And it, cause you may get lucky, you know, it may not be a no refusal weekend. Maybe the officer is about to get off and he doesn't want to go to the hassle. Or if you refuse everything, all the officer can say is, well, he had bloodshot eyes and smell of alcohol. Is that probable cause to get a search warrant to arrest you? That gives us at least something to argue in court that, okay, yeah, you took his blood. He's an 18 but did you have a right to take his blood? Because you had no field sobriety test. You had no clues on the HGN, the walk and turn, the one leg stand. Um, he didn't say much, so I don't know he had slurred speech. Um, he wasn't losing his balance because you refused to do everything. He immediately arrested you, put you in the car. Mm. It leaves, gives us an argument that- So continue to refuse the whole way through and mm -hmm. let them- Don't do drink and need. drive. And then if, sure. you, if you get arrested, <laughs> don't, you know, don't provide them evidence. If you're sober, I tell my clients cooperate. Right. But if you're not, you're giving them that, you're confessing. That's sure. what you're doing. You're providing a confession to them. Well, the warning that is read before you can ever give a breath or a blood sample, you know, tells you of the consequences of the driver's license suspension. But it also has a little blurb in there that says something along the lines of, and if you refuse, I'm going to go, I can go get a search warrant and get your blood anyway. So you kind of know if you're listening to the warning that they're giving you that that's a potential that they might go do but i'd say maybe at least half the time half of them do it they're not going to mess with it and then you go to jail and we're dealing with a case where they have the results of your field sobriety test but that's it and sometimes well, that's enough so that's a form of miranda rights what they're doing kind of it's required that they read it, it verbatim to the suspect so they know what they're asking them for and what the consequences of saying no or consequences of blowing over are. But I mean, it's a, ne it's a necessity if they're about to perform that or whatever they're doing, yes. that they say that, that word for word. It. Yes. That's after the arrest. Right. This oh, is okay. after they're arrested. Mm -hmm. Then if they read the DIC, provide them a copy and read the DIC 24 and advise them of their right to refuse. If they don't, their license can be suspended. Right. And some officers even have um, an app I've seen on their phones yeah. that is a verbatim reading of it. And they'll play it. And they'll just play it. And then that way they don't risk them messing something up or saying something wrong, wrong order or something like that. Okay. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's talk about, let's give a scenario that happens. Okay. You're pulled over. Officer approaches your window, starts talking to you. What's the process? Like, what happens then from that point on? Like, what, what would somebody expect to happen when, when that process starts? I think you're going to see a lot of questions about how's it going? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? Have you been drinking? Have you had anything to drink? When's the last time you ate? You know, they're going to usually have you out of the car by then with more questions. I've seen a lot lately where they say, well, you know, on a scale from one to 10, how intoxicated would you say you are? Which almost always burns the person who's answering because they're going to say anywhere from oh, two. five to 10. <laughs> right. If they I'm say a, they I'm had a, a couple. Five. I'm a yeah. two. <laughs> yeah. It, one, one piece of advice, if you're going to go out drinking, either have one beer or three beers because you always get in trouble when the answer is, I've had a couple beers okay. every time. That's what people will say. I've had a couple. Okay. And almost every time when the officer's like, okay, 
when you say a couple, how many do you mean? You mean three or four? Oh, maybe five or six. Mm -hmm. It's a standard response, but then when they investigate further, that's always, you know, a five or six. Okay, was that 12 ounce or six? Well, probably 16 ounce. You're like, okay, you just had 10, 12 ounce beers. Right. right. What time was your last one? What time was your first one? A lot of really specific questions that can help them kind of gauge what they're dealing with. Okay. Once from there, if they feel like between those answers and maybe physical signs they're seeing, like bloodshot, watery eyes, slurred speech, odor of alcohol, then they're gonna, they're not gonna really ask you permission to do the field sobriety test. It's gonna be more like, well, I've got some tests I need to let you do so I can decide whether you're good to go home or not. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm yeah. on your side, take these and you'll do fine and you can just go on your way and they'll just go lead right into the field sobriety test. And that's at the point where you would say, I, I don't wanna do that or I refuse to do that. My that's attorney, look, saying. I understand you're trying to do your job. My attorney advised me not to do these tests. He didn't feel like they're accurate. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Um, but I, I can't help but follow my attorney's advice and I apologize that I'm not going to help you, you know, do your investigation. I'm mm -hmm. really sorry. So you give that response. Typically, what's the response from the officer? Sometimes they'll engage with you. I feel like to try to convince you, well, Hey, I mean, if you do good on them and you're good to go, then you, I'm letting you go home. Is that, are you sure that's what you want to do? And, okay. or it's turn around, put your hands behind your mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Or sometimes they will pull out what's called a portable breath test. You know, the, uh, the actual official reliable instrument is you know a large unit that's at the station typically mm -hmm. but um a lot of officers particularly troopers will have a small device portable breath test that they'll have you blow in right there at the scene it's usually not admissible in court but gives them some idea of what they're dealing with and so a lot of officers at that point will say oh, okay well can, can you just blow in this for me so i know if you're good to go home um i would refuse that too because it's that, not reliable Right, it's not reliable enough, but they can they can testify that my device showed they had alcohol in their system. That is admissible. They just can't give the number because it gives you the same number that the official intoxilizer machine gives you. Mm -hmm. um, it's not certified and it's accurate, so it's not admissible. But it still gives you an 18. The officer, you blowing your what we call PBT, and it's an 18. You're not leaving the scene. It's just, the officer's going to arrest you because he knows that that's close enough. Mm -hmm. He knows it's not you know right. point one off, point one zero off. Okay. How often does that happen? You say that you refuse and they say, okay. So at that point, if they say, all right, turn around, I'm going to cuff you. Then what happens at that point? You're going to jail and that you're going to have that paperwork read to you offering for you to have a breath or a blood test. Okay. I've never seen someone leave when they've refused. Oh no. Never. Not once. Okay. And they could get to the station and they're 0.05, but they may not charge them then. We never see those. Okay. But I've never seen one say, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm sorry, I can't cooperate. It's like, all right, man, I understand. Here, just be safe. Yeah. No. Going home, it doesn't happen. You're going to jail. Yeah. You might beat the rap down the road, but you're going to jail. Yeah. You're not going to beat the ride. So you get the ride, you go to jail. What, what's the expectation there? Well, it depends on if you've refused or not. Right? If you've refused. If you say, I, I don't want to do anymore. You're going in a holding cell and your bond will get set the next morning. And you'll be there 12 to 16 hours. Okay. If you're in Fort Bend County, Harris County, you're there at least 24. Okay. What's the the Why is it different? Is it just the way that they do it? They're a little quicker. Yeah, the number of people. Bend. I mean, the jails aren't a customer service business. They don't <laughs> care. <laughs> They're not trying to get you in and out. Yeah. They just, you know, Harris County almost always is 24 hours before you even show up to be able to um, have someone post your bond. Yeah. In Fort Bend County, volume. it's usually about 12 hours. Yeah, it's not fun. What, what would constitute an op open container? Just like that. Any kind of container of alcohol that's not sealed. What about a Yeti? That would be open. You have a Yeti cooler, a, one of those Yeti cups, and you have a, a lid on it, and it's closed up. Would that be considered an open container? Mm, there's probably an argument to be made there, but you're going to, I would. If it's, if it's completely full, I think you got a much better argument than if it's half full. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you okay. can go buy the daiquiris with, like, the tape over the straw, and that's not supposed to be open, but I still wouldn't chance it. Yeah, yeah. If the daiquiri's half full, when you get pulled over, the officer's going to be like, hey, bro, <laughs> Ride with either you got ripped of off at the, at the daiquiri store or you've been drinking this. <laughs> I just wonder that because, you know, so many people use those Yeti cups nowadays and have alcohol in it. And it's going to be an open container. Yeah. It'd be an open container no matter what. Yeah. What, about, well, yeah. what about having a bottle of liquor in the car that has the top on it screwed shut, but it's in the back seat and it's half gone? I think you've got a little bit better argument there that it's not an open container. Okay. Yeah. Or like, you know, I think is, is part of it too, is, you know, yeah. if you have a bunch of open beers in the trunk of your car and you're driving, I think there's a great argument that it's not an open container because you don't have access to it. Yeah. And I don't know if you've got it on your list over there, but I'd like to get a little information out there about MIPs um, for the parents that have young kids. I mean, I got an MIP 
when I was younger. Got a couple of them. Um, some were bullshit. Some were valid, and I deserved it. Uh, what is the law related to MIPs as far as open container or not? If you're at a house party and there's alcohol there, is it? I mean, the house party situation, as I, it infuriates me because officers will get a noise call. It's a bunch of kids drinking. They'll go in the house. Of course, all the kids put the beer down by the time they come in because they're not stupid. And there's beer all over the house. But then they just start arresting kids for minor in possession. When they can't say that they were in possession of alcohol, they're standing near it. Is that possession? Uh, I don't know. But they'd arrest everybody because somebody's a jerk at the house and they're going to prove a point. Mm -hmm. Well, then we get them later and you're like, you can't prove this case. This is a waste of time. You're arresting these kids. You're giving them tickets. And they all get dismissed, typically, mm -hmm. on yeah. those situations. But still, the kids spent money, had to come into court, had to hire an attorney. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's a bad. Problem. It'll ruin your reputation when you're young, too. Mm -hmm. It'll mess you up. From a you know driving standpoint, you're 16, you're 17, you're driving around, you got a bottle of liquor, unopened beer in the trunk, whether it's open or unopened, liquor, bottles, beer, whatever. What What is the law related to that as far as what's going to work, what's not, what can you get charged with? It's kind of the same thing with any substance, cocaine, meth. Mm -hmm. if it, they got to show that you're in possession, care, custody, control, or management. I mean, if it's in the trunk of your car, is it your car? Is it your parents' car? Is it warm beer? You know, is there a receipt? Um, do you have alcohol in your breath? It's kind of all those factors that play in for them to show that you're actually in possession of it. But I mean, if you got four kids and there's liquor in the floorboard, someone's going to get an MIP ticket. Or all. Oh, or all, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All. Okay. When you have people that come up that get you guys because they've been DWI or whatever, I, I know the obvious things are they've been speeding, um, you know, driving erratically, whatever. Are, are there small things that happen to people out there that they get pulled over for and that happens an example when i was in college we had a guy that was at one of our houses we were hanging out having a good time whatever he never came back he went to do something and never came back we saw him a couple days after and he said he pulled up on a on a stop sign and those white lines and pulled up past it he's like he said i stopped completely he's like man i he said i know if i rolled or if i didn't i stopped completely but i stopped above the white line and pulled and turned to the right and then the cop pulled me over well, so that's why i asked that question mm -hmm. point yeah i have a I, I have probably two or three of those yeah for that specific stop it's that and not turning your blinker on 100 mm -hmm. feet prior to the intersection so if you get to a stop sign you're like oh that's a cop i better put my blinker on that's a crime if you turn you got to put your blinker on outside of 100 feet before your turn and you've been pulled over for that I have clients that have. Okay. Yeah, I have clients and the stopping past the designated point. Those mm -hmm. two are the most that and no bike light. That Te Harris no. County does that all the time. Well, and uh, tail li or license plate light. Yeah. License if you don't have light. that teeny tiny little bulb that's illuminating your license plate, mm -hmm. you can't stop. What's that. a bike light? You got to have a bike uh, light on your bike if you're driving after uh, dusk. Gotcha. And so you have these guys that are. You know, homeless guys or, 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 or guys in, that are they're riding their bike down the sidewalk and they don't have a light on their bike and the cops will stop them. And then and they have crack. They have in crack pocket. in their pocket or meth in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. There was another on, step man. there we were missing. Uh -oh. They're riding a bicycle uh -oh. and you stop them for no light on the bicycle and you find crack. And now that happens in Rosenberg all the time. Yeah. In Rosenberg. They know who the guys are. They know who's good for dope and they see them committing an offense. They're going to stop them. They're trying to get the, the dope off the street. I mean. As a cop, I would I would do that. I mean, if you know guys are, are, are selling dope or using dope a lot, it's not, not uh, good if, for the community. If you see them committing an offense. Yeah, if it's yeah. your job to That's do right. that, Stop then them. do your job. Yeah. Right. So, but any traffic violation is going to be good enough to make a stop. It's just what happens from there, right? If you're showing signs right away when the officer comes up to your window that you might be intoxicated, they're going to take that and investigate it. If you're not showing any of those signs, then they're probably going to give you a warning for it, you know? I know it would more than likely el escalate the situation and probably get a cop pissed off and things happen. But if a cop walked up and that was the case, what if you just didn't roll down your window? He's going to break I'll, your window and you're going to be pulled out. Yeah. Really? And you're mm -hmm. definitely going to Yeah, jail. you're going to jail for what okay. something. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe even the traffic offense. They call that, uh, what you've started off with is the offense of P.O.P., you know what that is? No. <laughs> Hissing yes. off the police. Oh. <laughs> I've seen You're a lot of that online, jail. people yeah. instigating, not rolling down the yes. window, trying to get insta-famous. It's a gotcha game. It's always, always, always going to work out better for a client if you are being courteous, if you're doing what you're told, 
even if you're refusing to do something like take a breath test or do a field sobriety test, you can do it in a polite and courteous manner. And I it's, mean, a, they have cameras on them all the time. Oh, yes. so and our jurors know when, when, when people get intoxicated, they're jerks sometimes. Well, they see you being a jerk on the video when I'm trying to convince them that you're not intoxicated. Not they help us. <laughs> jurors can understand driving, they can understand balance, and they can understand being a jerk. If you have those three things, bad driving, you're being a jerk, and you can't keep your balance, you're going to get convicted. Mm. I don't care what the BAC, you could have a BAC that's 18. If your driving facts are okay, you look good on video, and you're very polite, you got a decent shot of winning that case. They don't, that, that's science. They don't understand science. Mm -hmm. They understand what they see. They drive a car every day. They know if you're swerving over three lanes and driving on the shoulder of the road, they understand that. They're like, no normal person does that. They have to be either intoxicated on their phone or distracted in some other manner. Right. And if the officer does a good job, he's like, were you on your phone? No. Were you being distracted? No. Okay, well, there's only one other reason you're driving like that. It's because you're intoxicated. Yeah. Or I think too, if you present well, you were super courteous and polite and you have maybe a good career where you have a lot at stake to lose, that matters with the jury too. Well, and I think that's probably one thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration is that there's cameras and audio the whole entire time from the time they hit the lights to mm -hmm. pulling you over and talking mm -hmm. to you. And, and while you're in the back seat. Yeah, and I, I mean, we'll have a lot of cases where we'll, we'll, um, we'll look at it and he looks good on video, not bad driving facts. You're like, okay, we got a chance. On the way to the station, 25 minute ride, within five minutes they're dead asleep in the back of the car. And you're like, dude, you just got arrested <laughs> for DWI and you're falling asleep and the camera's on you and they'll show 20 minutes of you sleeping in the back of the car and you're just sitting there with your client like, look, bro. Or your, mo your mother F and the officer and telling them that's right. what a piece of crap they are and how dare they do this and that to you and that doesn't yeah. look good either. No, I could imagine that that doesn't present well. Don't on you me. know who I am? We That's right. One of those yeah, I'm going to have your job. Oh, have you, you're going to get fired. For have this. you had? Have you seen oh, those? Oh, half the time, <laughs> and people that say they're going to get their job. Yes. Know who I am. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and you're sitting next to your client, I, and that's a 20 minute video I of them acting an ass. I pay with my taxes. Yeah, that one. Yeah, right. I make more in a week than you make in a year, <laughs> and you're like, and you're. We should do there. a whole show on this. Oh, geez, it's terrible. <laughs> and in the front of a jury. They play that video and it's like it's an eternity as you're watching that 20 minutes of them just being an ass and you're just sitting there like and nothing you do. You can't object. You can't stop it. You can't say anything. It's just silence and your client being an ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's excruciating. They have to watch the whole video. If it's helpful to the state, you can. Oh, oh, damn I'm sure they're going to play. I'd the whole play thing. it in the questioning of the officer. I'd play it in closing. I'd, yeah. Every time I had a chance, if I was a prosecutor, I'd let him see that. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, this, this guy's an ass. Yeah. As a prosecutor, one time I had a case where the guy, instead of doing the, like, walking the nine, turning around and walking back, he thought it would be entertaining to do the moonwalk there and back. So you can bet your ass I played that, like, four <laughs> times during the trial. I mean, who would that just shows classic intoxication right there. And right. there's nothing worse than when your, your client, they have you, your client dead to rights, and it's a piece of evidence or a video and you have to just sit there and take it. Like I had a, I tried a murder case several years ago in, in Harris County and the allegation was my client choked his girlfriend to death. Well, their expert said it takes about two minutes for them to be, to, to, to stop their heart and be dead. Mm -hmm. And so in closing arguments, the prosecutor's like, all right guys, this is how long he choked her. We'll start now. Dead silence. Dead silence for two straight minutes. And I'm like, oh dude, this is so bad. It's brilliant. It's, uh, yeah, brilliant. And that's what I said. I'm like, this is brilliant. For two minutes and he's like oh no he's still choking her we got 30 seconds left wow <laughs> it's like oh no he's still choking her he's still squeezing her neck he's got 10 seconds and i'm like oh my god <laughs> and got convicted and well because five. if you say two minutes you're like ah, what's two minutes oh, but if you really time. sit and Dude, count two minutes it's, it's a long it's, time it's the longest two minutes of my life <laughs> i bet i know it's the longest two minutes of my client's life yeah. it was terrible yeah it was terrible. yeah yeah i i, I that would have been it's a terrible situation, but it would have been it would have been entertaining to be in there to see just the the tenseness of that. I bet that was just it's 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 probably the most powerful two minutes of any any case. I've oh, I'm tried, sure. Without question. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Is there any what, what about if you're driving and you hit something or 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 a car or something like that is. Are the processes all still the same? Is there any other advice that you'd have beyond what you've already said? If you've hit something or somebody or another car in this situation? Don't leave. 
obviously don't leave that would be my number one piece of advice you're going to pick up additional charges if you leave because i'm sure it'd be surprising how many people actually do oh yeah well i mean it's it kind of cuts both ways if you hit a car write a note address phone number stick it on the windshield and leave if oh, you're like intoxicated a parked car, you mean. A park car yeah. a park car okay if it's a, a moving car someone in it then obviously but or sure. a person sure stop but if it's a parked car and you're intoxicated if you leave your information you can't be charged okay but if if you don't leave your information you can okay that's good to know yeah so yeah if you hit a parked car don't and you're intoxicated don't sit around and wait for the cops to show up or go knock on someone's door you don't have to do that to stay away from getting charged with a crime give them your information get home as quickly as possible okay right. All right. Or even if you hit like a um, a mailbox or something like that, I would say same advice. Leave some kind of information behind with who you are because then you can't get charged for that because that would be an offense. Too. Yeah. I just had a case like that. A guy hit a mailbox, drove home, neighbor called the cops. And my guy's like, that's my friend. I knew he was out of town. He's vacationing in Mexico. I told the neighbor, hey, I live seven houses down. When he gets back in town, just let him know. I hit his mailbox. I'll fix it. Well, they, they cops came in and started investigating fail to stop and give information when striking a mailbox. And I argued, I'm not sure he committed a crime. He told the neighbor who he was and where he lived. That's identifying himself. I don't believe you have the right to then investigate him that turned into a DWI, which in turn was a breath test, which was a 0.27. So at least gave us some argument. Yeah. Um, and he got a really good deal. I mean, he still got convicted of DWI, but he's three and a half times the legal limit. Wow. So that is actually one thing we didn't talk about when we were talking about the different levels of DWI, though. Mm -hmm. So if you have an accident, let's say with another moving car and you cause um, serious injury to another driver. OK, first time you've never had a DWI before, you're still going to be looking at a felony, the felony offense of intoxication assault. OK, that's a third degree felony, just like a, your third DWI. Mm -hmm. If you. If your intoxication causes an accident and that causes a person to die, intoxication manslaughter, that's a second degree felony, two to 20. Or under some circumstances, let's say it's your third DWI and you kill a person, there's ways the state could charge you with felony murder. Wow. So you're committing the mm -hmm. felony of a third DWI and you kill somebody, which is a first degree felony, five to life. Mm -hmm. Jeez. So there you can work your way all the way from a class C misdemeanor all the way up to a first degree, depending on the circumstances of the intoxication. Well, and one thing I want to bring up that I called you about not too long ago, uh, somebody got into a wreck on a boat. So let's talk about how DWI and intoxication uh, all plays into whether, whatever type of vehicle you're in. Uh, you know, even if you're on a golf cart, on a bike, in a boat, on a four-wheeler, it's all the same thing. Motorized vehicle mm -hmm. over 50 horsepower or a boat? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, not on your bicycle. Nah, not a bicycle. I think electric is going to get interesting. Bicycle is going to be a PI probably. Yeah. Probably. Probably going to change at some point because of all the electric vehicles coming out. They're not necessarily horsepower. They're not motors. Mm. Uh, but they get up there a little bit. They Oh, for sure. I have I was a buddy of mine tonight. It's like he has a little scooter. It's electric and goes 30 miles an hour. And he just rides it on the streets. Mm. So that, that can get interesting. I don't know if that... I'm sure that argument's been made. I haven't seen it with an electric vehicle. You see it with golf carts. Mm -hmm. um, how would they classify an electric vehicle if you're not talking about horsepower? How do they classify that? I mean, it still has a motor. Though. Yeah, it's a, I mean, that's where it gets tricky. because it, But it it's not a combustible a, motor, so, I mean, you don't have any... Right, what's the definition of motor? Because some, Teslas have motors, but they're not, like you said, a combustible motor. It's electric. Yes. So does that... I don't. I have to look at the statute a little closer. I bet closer. that's been litigated. Actually, it probably surely has. it's been litigated. I'm sure it has. I mean, because yeah. there's a ton of them around. Somebody's got a DWI on a Tesla before. Mm -hmm. For sure, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, but they haven't changed laws on that though. No, but a, but definitely boats. There's a whole separate section for boating under the influence. And some of these scooters are you know less than 50 horsepower. So if you have a motor, it's still less than 50 horsepower that mm -hmm. it has to for you to be able to get a DWI. Okay. I really kind of hit everything that I wanted to say and, and questions that I had. I think it's important that people know those steps and those processes because a lot of times, which we've talked about in other scenarios before, people kind of screw themselves up because they don't, just don't know what to do. You know, I mean, they get in a situation and like if I was something like that happened to me without us having this conversation, it's like what you said about putting the note on somebody's car. Like I would have I would not have any idea what to do there. Mm hmm. If, I, if that would have happened, I would have just been like... And yeah, take a yeah. picture of it with your phone. If I would have hit a mailbox drunk, I would have kept on driving. 
Right. And just be like, shit, let me hurry up and get out of here. Hope Correct. nobody saw me. And, and there's an argument for that. I mean, there's an argument to get out of there as fast as you can, hope the cops don't show up or catch you in time, rather than stopping and putting your note on the car or on the mailbox. But, you know, your judgment's always is not typically the best when you've been drinking. So. Sure. Well, like you said at the beginning, don't drink and drive. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not worth it because, no. I mean, it's all fun and games. Okay, I get a Class B misdemeanor until you kill somebody, and then you're— you may go to prison. Well, and I, I ha actually had, just as a story, kind of what you were talking about, I actually had somebody that I went to high school with that I heard a story about where they went to a party, had a glass of wine, drove home, was involved in a collision, which they were at fault for, N not driving crazy, but they had a glass of wine, and somebody died as a result of that accident. And luckily for him, he was not over the legal limit. He was fine because he had one glass of wine and he, you know, he did the whole thing. Everything was fine. But I mean, you well, know, if he had had two or three, right, that could have been a much different situation. The state does have to prove in those circumstances, though, that the intoxication was the the proximate cause, is the language we use, or the, the direct cause of what caused the person's death. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you are like a point one two and you get into an accident but it's because somebody pulled out right in front of you and it has absolutely nothing to do with anything you did or your intoxication the argument there is that the intoxication wasn't the direct cause of causing this person's death it was because they pulled out right in front of me on a motorcycle or something like that but somebody ran a red light and you mm -hmm. hit them so but that's the fight you're usually going to see in trials for intoxication manslaughter if it's obvious that the person's really intoxicated, it's going to come down to a causation fight. Right. And a lot of times it's two o'clock in the morning. You may not have a lot of witnesses and the benefits typically not going to go towards the intoxicated driver. Right. So if you have sure. a collision at intersection, there's no witnesses. I mean, the state can't prove you because of your intoxication, you caused that accident, but everybody thinks you did because you're the intoxicated one. Well, yeah, because right. I would assume you're going into the situation, you're the accused and trying to adjudicate a situation where you're saying, it didn't happen as a result of that. That's really hard to prove. Well, and sometimes you'll have where both are intoxicated. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. And just, it, you know, you're both over in 08, but this one happens to die as a result of it. So then it really comes down to whose fault was that death. Right. So that's or they're both committing traffic trial. offenses. Both of them are racing. Both are intoxicated. They're going 120 miles an hour. One of them runs off the road and dies. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, gets clipped. You know, it makes it difficult for the, for the prosecutor to prove that, who was the proximate cause of that when they're both intoxicated. What is the biggest word of advice that you have for somebody that is driving, gets pulled over, and it's possible that they are intoxicated? Be courteous, be polite, and politely refuse to do any of the field sobriety tests or provide a breath or blood sample. When, you, when and if you get arrested, get with us immediately because there is a lot of very... Um, tight deadlines when it comes to some of the administrative stuff involving DWIs with your driver's license suspension and things like that. So refuse, po be polite, call us immediately. And what is your guy, how, how do you contact you guys? Give you guys phone number again for locally here in Houston. Okay, our office number is 281-302-5513. And then the rest of our information is on our website, the defenseattorneys.co and that Facebook. And that's a number that can be... It, that can reach anybody at any time no um our website i think has both sean and i's direct cell phone numbers so those numbers can be reached at any time okay um, but i mean and when i say call immediately i mean like you get arrested on a friday call us first thing monday morning and then get into our office because you're going to have some time to uh, you're going to have 12 to 24 hours yeah of there's nothing we can do at the time of the arrest other than piss off the police officer yeah. you don't want to do that yeah okay so everybody wants oh, i want my attorney here you don't have a right to an attorney for field sobriety tests for making a decision if you want to provide a breast sample if you want to cooperate with the search warrant we have no you have no right to an attorney at that point we can't do anything so if so a client calls us in the middle of the night it's like hey i'm getting arrested for dwi there's nothing we can do. I mean, we can go up there and act like we're going to hold their hand, but there's nothing we can do. It's they're going to do their thing and they're going to kick, kick us out. They're not going to let us back there. Sure. Okay. Well, in addition to the phone number and the website, uh, the podcast is now going to go live on iTunes. Sweet. So it's going to be criminal law on iTunes, Google play, uh, podcaster and Spotify. So people will be able to go subscribe. If you liked this, got any value from it, be sure to share it. Tell a friend about it. Go to iTunes, Criminal Law Podcast, download it, and 
We'll see you on the next one, huh? And see our other videos. We've done uh, marijuana. We've done gun law. We've done. Uh, we've met these guys. So if you want to meet them, we have our where we got to meet y'all. And maybe Phoebe next time. We'll. I think be able Phoebe's to see Phoebe. coming the next couple of weeks for expunctions. There's yeah. going to be a change in the law that'll be very beneficial to. Mm-hmm. We we're talking about that last week. Countless but. individuals who've been convicted of crimes. Good. Yeah. Well, good. Thanks, guys. Get that off the record. Thank you, guys. Right. Thanks for having us. Podcastmarketing.com for more information. Appreciate y'all tuning in, and we'll see you on the next one. Let's drink while we talk about DWI. There you yeah. go. It, that's, I mean, that's Breaking the best way to do it. Having a couple. I know, and you're going to pull it like, <laughs> I had a, really had a couple. We can testify <laughs> for you, though. Yeah, correct. Well, we've got it all on video, so, you yeah. know, they got any questions about that. Um. Hmm. Oh, here's a good one. If you could go back in time, what one thing would you tell your teenage self? If you could go back in time, what one thing would you tell your teenage oh, self? You do? Yes. Let's hear it. So okay. So if you know, because I think Amanda's still all. thinking. I am. Dumbass. There's so many things. Yeah. You don't know it all. Yeah. I thought I knew everything. Yeah. And I was an idiot. Or be kind would probably be one of them, too. I was a mm-hmm. cocky little prick. <laughs> no. We're not recording yet, are we? <laughs> yeah, I would like, Oops, be kind. We'd be such a prick all the time. It's Yeah. Amanda? I think mine would be related to boys. And so I hope my girls listen to this. Like, boys are not the most important thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Hold out for the good ones. Like, mm-hmm. don't let your life be run by boys. Boys. But do you think it will work though? Because I've got two, I've got two daughters, and I think about that thing too. But then I'm like, would it really work though? No. I don't know. Probably not. I don't think so. But I hope that it like resonates maybe with them at some point in the future. Yeah. When they're in like create you know a bad situation with the boy, maybe then they'll remember. Remember, mom said, for, "Don't let your life be just the heartbreak." By boys. Yeah. You know, boys, I just don't want to see the heartbreak. You know, I've yeah. got She's five. Be six November. It's, yeah. I don't want to see the heartbreak. Right. It's you know it's not. What that about important. you, G Funk? Ooh, I don't know. Um, there's more than life. There's more life than sports. I was just, yeah, I was true. all about sports. Yeah, and like I didn't even think about jobs or you know anything. Like I, I'm not saying that I should have gone back and looked at it and be like, you need to prepare for your career right now at 16 years old. But just be like, hey, like do a little bit better than just sports all the time. Like, oh, man, sp- for me, sports was like. That's all I did. Yeah, all day for me long. too. But I stayed out of trouble. As I say, got I you was, where you were. Right? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I, I don't know. Sports for me, I'd be like, I wish that was more of my life because I, I can see what you're saying, <clears> but it, sports was everything for me as well, and I always tried to stay on the straight and narrow because I was scared of the repercussions with sports. Well, what if I got arrested or I was, a, you know, I did something bad? I'd get suspended from the team or the coach would punish me. That always, that, Oh, that don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for it. And I loved it. And I wouldn't change that. I just would have been a little bit more well-rounded as far as that makes sense. You know, cause I mean, Sports I went through high school, life. I went through college and then I was, and when I was done with college, I was like, okay, now I need to be an adult, you know, and like now I need, and I just, I, I feel like I would have been a little bit better prepared for yeah. life after that, as opposed to, yeah, like, I can't play basketball athlete. now. What else? Move on. Next one. What about you? What? Yeah. What? Well, you're not going to say <laughs> that. Yeah. He has something good to yeah, say. He tried to move on that. Yeah. 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 You were ready for me to go to the next one real quick. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> if you could, you know what it was. If you could go back in time and tell your teenage self something, what would it be? I would have uh, told myself to choose a different mentor. Mm. That's good. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's good. Choose, choose your friends wisely yeah. is advice I would give. I give my clients that. I said, your friends can get you in more trouble than you could ever get yourself yes, in. Yes, sure. you are who you hang out that's with. That's right. Mm-hmm. I ran in the wrong crowds, and I wanted to impress the wrong people. Mm-hmm. So no, That can be devastating. Yeah. yeah. Choose Absolutely. your friends wisely. I like that one, Johnny. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>